Well, good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Medical, Medical Technology, the Innovation Imperative for Growth Stage Companies. My name is Ryan Muse and I'll be your X Talks host for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes and this presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. Now, the webinar is designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit your questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box. And we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel, which is on the right hand side of your screen. And if you encounter any difficulty and need any technical assistance, you can contact me at any time by sending a message using the same chat panel. At this time, know that all participants are in listen-only mode, and please note that the event will be recorded and made available for streaming on xtalks.com. At this point, I'd like to thank Veronex, who developed the content for this presentation. Veronex, with a fully integrated concept to commercialization solution, their design and engineering expertise sets them apart, providing you with visibility to development feasibility and opportunity along the way. Their expertise improves launch readiness and expedites the development of technology for regulatory and commercial success. They are ISO 13485 certified and FDA registered for medical technology product development. And with more than 30 years of experience and a global reach into emerging markets, their design and engineering specialization makes them a med tech visions a reality. Now I would like to introduce our moderator for today's event. Brandon Bogdalek has worked with dozens of medical device, drug delivery, diagnostics, and digital health companies on outsourced innovation and commercialization projects. In his current position, he represents the product development and engineering PDE function from a marketing lens, helping tell stories from internal and external subject matter experts that provide value and promote new thinking. He holds a bachelor's degree in biology from the University of Minnesota. So without further ado, I'd like to hand the mic over to Brandon to introduce the rest of today's panelists. Thank you, Ryan, for the warm introduction, and thank you all for taking a little bit of time out of your day today to participate in this conversation. Um, as Ryan mentioned, this is supposed to be an interactive discussion, so please feel free to use the chat function throughout uh, our presentation today. Ask as many questions as you'd like, and we'll take some time near the end uh, to answer Q&A. So um, I'll also say we have a great lineup of speakers today all of which I'm very excited to uh, introduce, and then we'll jump into the content for today. So without further ado, I'll start with uh, Michael Hill. Uh, Dr. Hill is a uh, experienced leader focused on patient-centered medical device innovations with nearly 30 years of experience at Medtronic. Uh, his roles span research, technology, product development, clinical research, regulatory, and leadership. And he continues to foster knowledge, sharing innovation and acceleration. Next, we have Nancy Schoenbrunner. Nancy is the CEO of Amplify DX and has ex a significant executive experience in the medical device and diagnostic field, including over 20 years at Roche Diagnostics and two years at Cypher Medicine. She is skilled in the planning and direction of technology commercialization, innovation strategy, R&D, and I uh, IP portfolios. Nancy has a history of creating value through global team management, partner development, strategic alliances, and product innovation. And last but not least, we have Tom Burke. Tom Burke, CEO and co-founder of Vail Scientific, has over 35 years of management experience and has served as CEO and COO of global organizations across the device sectors like corporate leadership, operations, business development, portfolio and project management, P&L, sales, and as well as marketing. His board memberships and chair positions span biotech, pharma, and diagnostics companies. Uh, again, we have an awesome panel of uh, very experienced and knowledgeable individuals, and we're very happy to have them here. And so before we jump into the subject matter for today's conversation, I'm gonna have Ryan launch a quick poll. Um, we'd like to get an understanding from the audience today around what your level of experience is commercializing medical technologies. We have folks on the panel today who have extensive commercialization experience, but we wanna make sure that we're tailoring this conversation today to what is most impactful for you. So if you could take a couple seconds um, and just tell us a little bit about your experiences as far as years, um, what we'll do is we'll shape the conversation. To Wow. 
All right, Ryan, I think we're probably ready to close out the poll. Okay, so it looks like we have uh, a, a broad, um, some broad experience in the audience today, um, but one to five years of experience seems to be the most. So I think what we'll try and do is based on the conversation that we have today, is gear it towards those who are a little bit earlier stage in their career, um, and uh, we'll go from there. So to get the first question of our conversation started today, I'm gonna have the panelists do a little bit deeper dive into their backgrounds, um, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started with uh, Michael Hill. Well, thanks, Brandon, first uh, for the opportunity to talk today and for the other panelists for joining me. I really appreciate it. So, you know, just a little bit of background. You know, my background, undergraduate and graduate, were all in biomedical engineering. And at the time that I took it, it was an interdisciplinary field. It really is the intersection of medicine and engineering. And at the time, people were kind of like, you know, are you a real engineer? What kind of engineer are you? And yet today in our environment, not being interdisciplinary is the unusual case. And so I think it's a very important aspect to think about how you're, how you're learning and, and moving into these things, because it really does take an interdisciplinary approach to actually move innovation forward. Um, that's part of it. You know, the other thing is, Brandon talked about my experience at Medtronic, and I was very fortunate to have an opportunity and um, the, the resources to basically do a lot of great things. I mean, I, I was at the front end of a lot of great um, therapies that are now treating patients all over the world, such as cardiac resynchronization therapy, um, transvascular valves, the micro, the Lewis pacemaker, um, heart failure diagnostics, a lot of different things that we actually worked on that are now actually in devices and helping people all over the world. So a great awareness of how you bring those innovations from a concept and take that journey that some that can sometimes be you know two decades to bring that to commercialization. And so they are long journeys in healthcare. You know, I continue to remain passionate. I do teach now innovation and entrepreneurship at Case Western Reserve University, the School of Engineering and the Weatherhead School of Management. And I do work, as Brandon said, with consulting small companies across the, the globe on um, trying to make better decisions. I mean, getting the knowledge, the right knowledge at the right time to make good decisions so they can accelerate what they're doing with innovation. Awesome, thank you, Mike, for your for your background. Uh, Michael has been a dear friend of mine for I'd say that coming up on the last five to six years and uh, his wealth of knowledge and experience in, in, the, in the medical technology space is unparalleled. So we're very, very happy to have you here and, and thanks for joining. Uh, Nancy, would you go, mind going next with your introduction? Sure. Um, so I'm also a technical person that's had um, the good fortune of working for a very large company with a lot of resources, uh, Roche, um, specifically Roche Molecular Diagnostics. I was actually hired and worked with the uh, original inventors of PCR. Um, so I had a very technical role at the beginning of my career and then moved up in you know, management, um, great training, and was fortunate to uh, sort of be able to still be have my hands on um, the technology and the people working in the lab, um, but also have that contact with the, the leadership um, and serve on life cycle teams. Uh, so really understanding the, the cross-functional business aspects to get a technology to market. Um, part of open innovation, so working with the chief technology office and business development to do the technology road mapping and scouting and working with the new and exciting technologies. Um, so great experience, but I always wanted to be really hands on and operational with a startup. So um, a few years ago, took that leap, um, have been involved in a couple now as co founder and um, a uh, very exciting space to be in, an exciting time. Uh, before the pandemic, nobody really knew what diagnostics was, and now everybody seems to be an expert in um, PCR and other technologies that <laughs> I've always worked on. So, yeah, it's very different being in the operational role in a startup. So, yeah, happy awesome. to be here. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. And uh, I know what your team is working on at Amplify DX is, is wonderful. And and you're right. I mean, I, I had a conversation not too long ago with somebody about how the diagnostic space has evolved even since COVID. It's it's, it's quite impressive, just a rapid uh, innovation that's happened in this space. So very, very happy to have you. Tom, how about you? Uh, yes, well, thank you for allowing me to be part of this. Uh, unlike my esteemed uh, panel members, I am not technical. I'm more of a, on the business side. Uh, and I, I have uh, had the good fortune to work in, um, in what I would call a number of startups, one of which was a, a small, relatively small family uh, pharma startup um, at one point that was in the neighborhood of about 2 million and we grew that to well over half a billion. 
in sales. Um, and since then, I've been involved in a variety of different startups in pharma and in the diagnostic space. Um, I have, as a result of that, a lot of experience in um, capital raising and all that it takes to, to organize a, a small organization to get it up and running. Um, and uh, currently running a company called Vail Scientific. I won't make this a commercial for Vail Scientific, but short story is it's a, it's a diagnostic in the sepsis space. Um, and uh, very excited to be a part of this panel and, and thank you for the opportunity. Awesome, thank you for your background, Tom. And it's a, it's a good segue into uh, our first conversation today, which is around the fundraising environment that that we're dealing with right now for for growth stage companies and um you know considering that we have a lot of um you know folks in the audience today who have anywhere between one to five years of experience i'm sure they're thinking about um how do i you know how do i fundraise in in, in this macroeconomic environment you know what are some best practices and, and what are some strategies and so um all of you i think feel this pain in in some way shape or form either with the organizations that you're working with or those that you've consulted with and so I'd be curious uh, if you could share some insights with with the audience today on what are some of those best practices? What is it like to raise right now? Um, and perhaps what are some mistakes that you guys have made um, or some things that you've done really well that would be valuable to share with the audience? So Mike, maybe we start with you and, and we'll go around the horn. Okay, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that I think about um, is, you know, we I always advise small companies to raise the appropriate amount of money for their stage that they're in. I mean, you don't want to get too much money and you don't want to get too little money. You want to get the right amount. And I know that sounds kind of funny, but you know, if you think about what you need to achieve to get to that next inflection point or big decision point, you really need to focus on getting the money for that amount so that you can be focused on answering the question adequately and effectively. You know, and the other thing is making sure that you don't get, you know, don't jump to venture capital as soon as possible. I think you need to utilize and exhaust almost all the non-diluted funding that you can. You know, and that can be grants, foundations, gifts, SBIRs. A lot of people don't think about SBIRs, and those are a great resource. I mean, two or three little companies that I've worked for, I've helped get them SBIRs on their first try. So, I mean, those are very important sources of funding that can be very important. And then the last one, which I guess I it makes sense to think about, but it's something to learn, is that, you know, the primary decision maker for the company also should be the primary owner of the company. And I know that that sounds kind of funny, but sometimes you have absent founders um, and venture capitalists run away from that. Um, and so, you know, people need to be actively engaged and you know, these part time things and, you know, not showing up for things. Um, that's a big sign that there's not the commitment um, from the team and the team is very important. And we'll talk about that later. But for me, that's just as equally as the important as the money. Awesome. How about you, Tom? What are your thoughts? I, kn I know that, you know, your team at Vail, you're in growth stage. Um, you guys are looking to bring a new technology forward. How have you found it in, in, in this environment to, to raise money? What are those conversations sounding like? I'd, I'd be curious to your thoughts. Sure. Um, well, it just I want to build on one thing Michael was saying earlier. Uh, I agree with uh, make sure you're getting enough money and there is a sweet spot. Uh, I would also say don't be very careful not to um, budget so tightly that you'd have no dry powder when you get to the end because that's um it will be a feeding frenzy if you are if you don't have money uh to kind of make that next step and you know depending on the type of investors you're looking at it could be very difficult to raise that money so um yes don't uh, don't get too much but don't be make certain if anything that you have enough um, so the other thing I would say is, um, I, you know, I think this environment is, is different. It's difficult. It's, it's more difficult than it was, say, two years ago. That said, I still think a good story, um, something that makes sense, that, that has uh, real market potential is still as viable as it was two, three years ago. It's a bit of the story and how you're telling the story. And, you know, uh, one of the things I would advise anyone that's uh, doing this for the first time is keep it really simple um an executive summary that's two pages it's very simple and the truth is it's hard to make something really simple it's a lot easier to to do a data dump in a in a deck and you know create 30 pages but no one's going to read it um so you know make make something simple in an executive summary then a very simple pitch that has three basic elements to it 
uh, what's the problem you're trying to solve, what's your solution, and what are you going to do with the proceeds that you're looking to to acquire. Um, and then thirdly, yeah, you want to have you want to have that deeper deck. You want to have the deck with science in it. But for the most part, the people that are writing the check are, for the most part, they're not scientists, right? They're investors, and um, giving them a lot of data is only going to make their I spin counterclockwise, and it's really not going to help you raise money. So that, that that would be my advice. Yeah. No, those are great insights. I had a conversation just yesterday with a panel in the diagnostic space about science, science-based founders, and the question to the panel was around uh, what would advice be um, to science-based founders when they start the fundraising process? And one of the big pieces of advice was make things simple. Right, the tendency is to want to jump into the science and the technology, but if you can distill it down into three main points and communicate that effectively to a venture partner or whomever you're trying to raise with, uh, it's it's likely you're going to be more successful. So no, I think that's that's super valuable. Nancy, how yeah, about you? It, sorry, um, just yeah. one thing to add on to that is you know you you hear the term elevator pitch, but that's a real thing. I mean, think about um, what can I say in three to four sentences to someone to that don't, knows nothing about my technology that they're going to be able to understand it and be able to walk away with it just a general sense of okay this is this is why this is interesting so sorry to interrupt no that no that's that's very true and and i think summarizing that elevator pitch perhaps that's the backbone to that the slide outline right for for that pitch deck and, and and maybe diving into just a tinge more detail but no i think that's great nancy how about you what, what has your experience been like um at, at amplify yeah so before amplify i have to say one thing i can echo mike on is um, having the cap table um properly balanced is important i've had a bad experience where that was not the case and no matter and investors ran away and no matter how I tried to convince those non-operational co-founders to allow for an address, they would not. And so I made the hard decision to shut the company down because of that. And it was the right decision. Um, with Amplify, um, so we have, we've done a combination of uh, private investment and non-dilutive funding. And specifically, I just did the calculation, it's a 71% non-dilutive, um, and then the balance is uh, private. Um, the non-dilutive is mainly SBIRs. Um, thank God we did that, uh, are, are doing that, especially in this market. So um, we're in a very crowded space. It's what's a molecular point of care. So there's been a great boom of um, great technology evolving um, rapidly in our space, which it needs to, but that means it's also crowded. And so it's extremely hard to raise um, private capital. Uh, it specifically did that with very um, technically savvy uh, business angels and angel networks and a few phenomenal early stage venture funds that understand our space. Uh, as soon as I got the first check from our lead investor, I hired a phenomenal group of grant consultants. Um, since I came from a big company, I didn't have that experience of writing SBIR applications. So I brought on the FreeMind group and it takes it's a long life cycle to get that non-dilutive funding between like doing the applications and the government takes its time with these reviews and then the contract negotiations so it's about a, a nine to twelve month life cycle until you like start working on the applications until you get that money in and so by now we've got three uh, phase one sbirs uh, we've had a, a we're on our fourth basically and have a pipeline of phase twos that could come in so thank God, because the market yeah. is really hard right now. Yeah. So if I were to just summarize that and maybe echo a few of the themes that I'm hearing from the panel of exhaust non-dilutive investment sources the best you can, right? Knowing it's going to be a little bit of a time consuming and, and a tedious process, but it's, it's worth it. Um, and then really have a refined story and pitch that you're going to go into with for private investment and be smart about what that cap table looks like. Um, it seems like that in, in this environment is, is really a, a recipe for success. So um, let's, let's change pace here a little bit. Um, at, at some point in time, after you raise money, non-dilutive, dilutive in nature, um, you're going to have to start thinking about how do I bring this technology into the commercial world? 
Um, and that transition comes with all sorts of ups, downs, and, and sideways, as, as you guys know. Um, and so for the folks in the audience who are in that process of commercializing and starting to think about that, um, I wanna provide some advice to them on things to expect, common roadblocks, um, and things that maybe they can get ahead of um, when they're thinking about going through commercialization. And so um, maybe to pose that as a question to the, to the panel, um, what is and are some piece of advice that you can give to folks um, who are starting that journey? Um, and, and Michael, maybe let's start with you. Okay, you know, I try to, in my mind, I always put the value proposition matrix in place. And so I think a lot of small startup companies do a good job of clarifying an important problem, right? For a very specific customer, because you need to know exactly who your first customer is going to be. And then defining that unique solution that solves the problem. And remember, the better you solve the problem, the better or more value you create. I think the often overlooked part is the creating the right team and assets to be able to bring it to market. And I know that that sounds a little bit softer or whatever, but I do think it's probably as critical as actually picking out the right problem. You know, it, it's a it's a team sport. Um, domain knowledge is extremely critical, but you know, I appreciate that I'm the technical guy and Tom's the business guy, right? I mean, we're both good at different things, if you will. And so together we can be very successful. And so, you know, defining and understanding who that right team is that can actually help solve the problem and create the right business model, bring it to scale, commercialization, those are the important things for success. But having the right team and unique assets, right, such as a patent or a know-how or a manufacturing process that makes you unique is also key for bringing innovation to be successful. Right. And so there's their uniqueness part that is with the team and the assets that you have at the beginning that help make it successful at the end. So that's just some kind of high level thoughts, I think. Oh, yeah, that's great. And I think that's under underestimated. I, I, we work with a lot of organizations who are intimately focused on on their technology and the technical problems that they need to solve. Um, but you're right. I mean, your skill set and Tom's skill set, that's. I mean, to use a, a bad reference, yeah, it's peanut butter and jelly, right? Science people, and they surround themselves with people who are science people who confirm what they think, right? And what they mm -hmm. need to do is find a business person, an operations person, somebody who does something that's different from them. They already bring that asset. And you have limited time, limited money, limited everything. And so you need to partner very quickly to start moving those things forward, right? Yeah. And that's using, using the understanding that you're not going to bring it by yourself. Innovation is a team sport. You don't do it by yourself. Yeah. Tom, would you build, how would you build on that? Um, well, the, the other thing I would build on that is know your lane. Um, you know, if, if you're the technical person, know you're the technical person and not the commercial person and vice versa. Um, the, the other thing I might <clears throat> um, add to that is that, you know, particularly in the startup world, most everyone enters it with the idea that, you know, I'm going to have this big exit at some point and the big payday and, 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 you know, they focus on maybe that exit coming before commercialization. Um, and that would be great. Uh, I would say, you know, being going commercial is an, is a daunting task. It's huge. It's very expensive. Um, and that said, it, it can increase your value a great deal. Um, what I advise any small company is even if they think there's like a 90% chance that they're going to be able to um, find a, an acquirer for their business before they go commercial, they want to look just crazy enough to go commercial. And by that, I mean, uh, you want to build a plan. You want to, you want to make sure that, you know, anyone that's going to acquire you sees that there's there's the potential that you could go commercial without them. And uh, that's important. Uh, that's important and it's part of your negotiation. It's also important to help uh, lay out the commercial market as you see it, because the acquirer will, will be interested in that. Um, certainly they're going to do their own diligence, but, but what they would like to see is what, what's been your thinking as you've been developing this along the way. And if you're not thinking if you're developing technology without thinking about the commercial um, aspects of it, then you you basically have a very expensive science project you're doing. And uh, so make sure you, you have some view to what is commercial going to look like. Yeah, I think that's 
that's spot on. I mean, one of the things that we often see is, um, you know, when <laughs> when you are going commercial and you're starting to, to think about that, and you're starting to engage, you know, potential strategic partners, um, there's elements of your organization that you build out that need to look commercial. And then there are certainly elements too. It's where they don't need to, to be all the way there knowing that you're, you're hedging, you're placing bets in, in different places, right? Because your, your resources are limited. And so how you play that game and, and the different things that you invest your time and energy into and the different resources you bring in your organization to make that happen are really important. Um, so you know, I like what Tom said, you know, he said, basically it start with the end in mind. If you don't know where you're going, how do you make a path to get there? Right? So I agree with Tom, right? Start with the end in mind. Now it can change and path and serendipity happen all the time, but you need to start with the end in mind. Yeah, Certainly. Nancy, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, I totally agree. Uh, we hope for pre-commercial exit, but you have to plan for a post-commercial exit. You have to understand your market, your target customer. Why are they going to buy your product? Um, so over time, we started very technical. By now, we've got a, a, an extremely cross-functional team with uh, commercial, finance, operations, clinical, uh, business development, um, expertise, manufacturing, uh, quality regulatory. Um, I've had to be very uh, careful and use um, the you know, options um, to get people to work part-time. We go into our network, people that really want to make a difference. Um, so when you're cash poor, you, you, you can bring on some really good people if you're clever, you know, using options, obviously, because it's important to have that cross-functional aspect. We're doing our own voice of customer, direct voice of customer. Um, I, then for the commercial aspect, we've got somebody very senior that will be able to come on um, and lead a commercial team once we raise a series A. But in terms of the actual sales and distribution, we are either going to find a strategic partner that will do that, that hopefully becomes the acquirer. But we also have a, another option that's very low cost. We won't have as much margin from the sales, but that's okay because you have to prove that somebody wants to buy your product, you can make it, the FDA allows it. Um, so we all work in regulated uh, in a regulated industry. So the FDA is the FDA. They get to decide it's necessary but not sufficient for success, but it's absolutely necessary. And you just never know with the FDA. So do everything you can to understand what they're looking for, what they will accept, but they can always change their mind. So you have to have backup plans. Yeah. So I'm going to... And just to build on that, you you mentioned something about doing your own voice of customer, and you kind of then went on to talk about what the FDA is looking for. And and the root of this question, uh, you know, again was is really about like challenges with commercialization and how to avoid them. And so I guess in in your guys' experience, have you seen investments in things like voice of customer, user research, human centered design, as as an avenue to avoid Tra avoid tragedy down the road with, with the FDA when it comes to missing something important um, when when you're bringing a, a new technology to market and I, I ask that question because those things are expensive and they take time right and you know a lot of the time uh, these organizations they don't have a ton of time and they don't have a ton of resources and so if this is you I mean are you are you investing time and energy into going out and, and engaging with that customer base to drive the design of your your solution or just tell me a little bit about that thought process, at least for you guys. Yeah, I'll just jump in. You know, I, the companies that I'm working for, the little small companies, you know, that's that's clearly part of the reason that I got involved with them, I think, is because I do think that they're doing that correctly up front. I think that those that come in and say, I've got this great idea, it's a mousetrap, everybody wants a new mousetrap, right? And they jump into it like that, they're not going to be successful, right? I think that it does mean, you know, the inputs of the system are the most important. If you put garbage into the system, you're going to get garbage out of the system. And so the input, spending the appropriate amount of time on the inputs, whether that be user feedback, whether that be technology choices that you're going to use for making whatever you're doing, um, understanding use conditions of how it's going to be used out in the field, all these kinds of things. If you don't put the right inputs in, then you're not going to be very successful. So that is a very necessary part of the whole process. And I think spending the right time up, 
up and up front. And if you don't have those capabilities, then partner with somebody that does to help you get them because the inputs are the most important part of the whole system, I think. Yeah, um, uh, it, I mean, I, I, would, I would agree with that 100%. Um, you know, and, and I am no regulatory expert, so you can dismiss what I'm about to say, but I'd like to think that, you know, if, if you understand the customer and the customer need, the FDA may not, right? And, and if you can at least provide them with, you know, here's some of the research, this is what docs are saying, or this is what, you know, the medical professionals are saying, you know, they may dismiss it, I don't know. But, um, but I, I think that is useful information, certainly with the agency. But more importantly, it's, it's useful information to you, it's useful information when you're going commercial, it's useful information to whoever might be acquiring you. So I, I, I don't think you can go forward without understanding the, you know, the end user's needs um, and how your product fits that need or doesn't. No, Tom, I agree with that. You know, partnering with the regulatory agencies up front also, right? When we talk about partnering up front with, you know, other people that have other skill sets, you know, I would say, you know, I push the companies to go for an interact meeting or an introductory meeting with FDA early, early on. Because if you actually start that conversation with them, they feel engaged, they will help you. I mean, especially small companies, I mean, it's different if it's Medtronic. I mean, we're huge, right? We have tons of regulatory people and experience and everything. But if you're a small company, they will help you. They will put you, you know, they'll say, go look up this reg, go talk to this person at the FDA, we'll help you. And so partnering up front. Now, some of the regulatory consultants want you to have everything kind of completed before you go. And I would argue that's their expertise. That's where they want you to be. But earlier conversations with FDA and partnering them are, I have found to be always helpful in moving mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. Awesome. No, that's a great, I think that's really important for the, for the audience to, to understand and, and to dig into, right? It's always a balance of uh, how you're going to spend your time and your energy and uh, along that path uh, to commercialization, right? So uh, I think those are great insights. Um, we will let's pivot the conversation a little bit. I want to talk about team structure. We've already talked about this a little bit, which I, I, I think it's great to build on. Uh, and this notion of having in-house talent and people that you sit right next to in the office every day compared to bringing in an outside consultant or a service provider. Um, and, and what like that decision making, I think, is really, really important for people to understand. Um, and so I, I, I think I would like to you know, ask you guys, you know, based on your own personal experiences, what have worked well? You know, what, it, what makes sense to have next to you um, and in-house on your team compared to, you know, hey, th it, this worked really well when I, when I engaged with this particular consultant um, or service provider. And Tom, maybe you know, we'll go the opposite order this time. Maybe start with you and, and then go to Nancy and then we'll go to Michael. Sure. Um, so <clears throat> I've had experience in in uh, in a startup where I was literally the only employee, uh, and and had consultants doing all the work. That's not a great scenario. Uh, it is a uh, it is a low expense scenario, but it's not a great scenario. If, if it were, if I had the money and the wherewithal, I'd want to have um, you know someone someone that that is going to be overseeing the, the clinical work. That doesn't mean doing it, that means overseeing someone doing it. Um, someone that's going to oversee the regulatory. Again, not necessarily someone that's doing all the regulatory, but someone that's overseeing it. Uh, I would wanna have someone in-house that I can really lean on uh, that understands IP. Because at the end of the day, that's what we're selling uh, is the IP. And, um, so I really want to make sure that that's, that I have someone, again, that understands the IP, not necessarily do I need an attorney, but I need someone who really understands the IP and how I, the IP system works. And yes, you know, outside of want to have good, strong uh, IP counsel. Um, finance, yes or no. I mean, um, sometimes it's good to have finance within, sometimes it's less necessary. So it really is, is situational, I'd say. Um, so those, to me, those are kind of the main ones, uh, with one other exception, uh, someone who understands commercial, the commercial process. We just went through a rather lengthy discussion about why that's important. Again, not looking for someone that is, uh, going to create it all, but someone that can oversee the folks, consultants or otherwise that would help to create it. So those, those would be the important elements for me. Yeah. 
I'll, I'll ask a follow-up question, not only to you, Tom, but to the to the panel when they give their their answers. And it's it's more around the, the technical side, like the, the R and D and the engineering and like the, the core of your technology. Um, you know, I I had a conversation with a few panelists yesterday, and they all felt very strongly that having the fundamental, you know, what is our technology and the engineering in-house, um, and then looking kind of outside for that. And so. It, has that been your experience too, Tom? I know you have scientists and engineers that are on, on your team. Um, wh what are your thoughts on that? Uh, it depends, is my thoughts. Um, in, in our case, I don't view that's necessary to have the engineers in-house. Uh, what is important is to have the scientists in-house, the te technologists in-house mm -hmm. that understand how to do it. But you know, unless you're creating something completely new um, and you need engineering, you know, then you, yeah, I'd want engineering in there. But if it's, if what you're really doing is taking the, the thoughts of your technical people and, and transferring that into uh, engineering work, in my view, not necessary. Nancy, what are your thoughts? Um. Yes, I, I focus on building uh, what I consider an acquirable asset. Um, so I know how this was looked at um, on the acquiring side, uh, what's of interest. Um, we are creating something new, So, uh, but the engineering is done once, and then you've got the design file. Then you need to be able to, there's certain aspects on the science and engineering side, especially the system integration, that needs to be internal, um, where you bring everything together. Uh, we create tests, diagnostic tests or assays, so you need to be able to do that internally. Um, and then in terms of, so that there's certain uh, key R&D technical aspect that is the acquirable asset, that is the IP. You have to have that know-how in-house. In-house does not mean they are full-time employees. Um, you, you find ways to align with the, the very precious um, dollars that you have to make sure you've got somebody that will go with the company once it's acquired. Um, in terms of all of the other aspects, like re relationships are very important understanding the product and how to get it to market and how to get it successfully through and all of those relationships, whether it's with the regulatory bodies or with customers, that's also part of the acquirable asset. So those resources are in-house. Again, it, at the right time, they can be, when we can afford it, they're full-time employees. Got that's it. And, how, and how, how do you think that changes? And I'm sure it changes a lot. So this is kind of a-, mm -hmm. a, a Over time. A mm -hmm. But like, Oh, not necessarily over time, but like I, thinking about your experiences even back to when you were at Roche, which is a, a large company, right, with a lot of resource and a lot of internal folks. Like, how do you um, do you think about partnering and resourcing internal versus external differently inside of an organization like that compared to where you know at Amplify? Like, talk about mm -hmm. the talk about the differences there a little bit. Yeah. Uh, Roche would always prefer to do things in house if they had the capability and capacity. Um, that's not necessarily the most capital efficient way um, or fastest time to market either. Uh, so for startups, moving fast is really important. And so I find it really helpful. Um, and we were found, like we were started with our external development partners. So uh, that's a, a great way to be able to toggle, turn on and off um, and keep, and yet, um, through proper alignment on incentives to keep people motivated for the long haul. So for a startup, like you, you just, you can't, uh, at least in my space, I don't know, investors don't love diagnostics. They don't get the best, best return on investment. We have to be creative. We can't just go out and hire 20 people. I can't do that. Yeah. Awesome. So, ex Michael, so I, external, I, I, external partnerships are critical. That's, that's yeah. the bottom line. For okay, sure. So I'm going to summarize it, Brandon, a little bit of what I think both Nancy and Tom said. You know, I'm going to start back with something that I mentioned before about having the right team and unique assets for your company, right? And so I think that's one of the most important things a successful CEO can do is be very reflective on what they have and what they don't, 
right? And, and also understanding what you're, what you're lacking, right? And so if you want to add knowledge um, or capability or something else, you know, you need to make sure you, you have limited resources. So, you know, I think that it's important that you find out exactly what you have, but then you need to strategically partner with things that will accelerate your timeline, be somewhat cost effective, but that are not core to your unique differentiation, right? So if it's a manufacturing thing, you know, you have to have that patent or your science or your knowledge or whatever it is, the business model, something that's unique for you. You need to have the people and the asset in-house. And then the other things you can outsource to be just easy about it, right? But those things are added value to get you to accelerate. And so I think that's a very important reflection of a CEO. Now, I appreciate Tom, you know, he said maybe he doesn't need finance. Well, I would be the one that would need the finance partner. <laughs> he may not. Right, I've got the technical skills, but I'm going to be looking for someone with business experience, right? And so it's understanding what you have and what you don't have, and then saying, you know, is this unique? What's a unique asset? And I would say I have a patented science, right? I need a business partner to actually help me. Now, if I'm a business person and there's a great idea, then I might be looking for a technology person to help me think how do I make this best, right? But again, it's reflecting on what you have. But you need to have the right team that's core, and then that unique asset or so that help you to differentiate what you are to create that value. Yeah, I think that's spot on. And I think it summarizes nicely, you know, what uh, Nancy and Tom both also added to to that. Um, so thank you. That That's great. Um, we'll move on to the last question here. And then I do want to reserve a little bit of time for q and I do see we have a question or a couple questions actually um, that we can uh, get to the audience with. But um, a lot of, you know, this whole talk is about the innovation imperative, right? For for growth stage companies and, and bringing new technologies to market. And at some point in time, that's going to involve some outside of the box thinking, some creativity. Um, and you know, in in this industry that that we're in, being highly regulated, I think innovation and creativity is of the utmost importance. Um, and and doing something truly new and, and novel. And so I think it would be interesting for each of you to to share a little bit of a story about you know, a time when your team really used that kind of outside of the box thinking uh, to, to kind of help move the needle forward on, on commercialization. And so Nancy, um, maybe we, we, we start with you. I'd, I'd love to hear, um, you know, a, a story from you on, on how you've been able to make that happen. So I feel like we think outside the box every day. <laughs> you have to every single day do that. Um, Oh, drawing a blank on like one one key example of how we've how we've done that. Uh, uh, we're using a unique uh, partnership to accelerate our development. Um, it's not my primary business uh, goal to do that, but it allows us to accelerate development while we're developing some key internal um, capabilities. So in a sense, taking a shortcut. Um, I yeah. can't go into <laughs> proprietary. No, no. It, it's a great example of, of, it doesn't need to be, sometimes innovation isn't um, this big fancy, aha, amazing thing. Sometimes it's just thinking about things in a slightly different manner, right? It could be a partnership um, and, and just simplicity. There's there's simplicity and creativity. Um, Mike, Mike, how about you? I, I know you, you've, in your experience at Medtronic and even outside of Medtronic, I mean, you innovation is 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 your world. Uh, so I'd, I'd be really curious to to hear your thoughts on this question. Yeah, I have lots of examples, but you know, I'm going to use one that I think is actually interesting because you know the, the micro or the Leela's pacemaker I think is a very interesting example. You know, I worked at Medtronic and Earl Bakken, you know, helped basically develop the early pacemakers and we created the pacing market. And I think Medtronic is the only Fortune 100 company that has basically held more than 50% market share worldwide and since its inception of the market right and that's been over 80 years or so so it's, it's pretty incredible but you know to think about leadless pacing leadless pacing is a new idea you know i just said you know how do you make it unique i mean leadless pacing isn't unique from the standpoint of an idea the idea was actually published in 1970 by strickland and it actually had a catheter delivered it was implanted in the right ventricle everything right active fixation mechanism and pace in the ventricle. At the time, the technology would only allow about a two-week operation. Right? That wasn't that that didn't really help. Right? I mean, they said maybe we could use nuclear or we could do something else. Right? But it never really came. It took 40 to 45 years for the technology to develop so we could actually 
create it and make it real. So that it would be a 10 year long VVIR or ventricular single chamber rate responsive pacemaker that you placed in the ventricle. Unique assets that Medtronic had though, is that we have always had in house our battery manufacturing. How do you make a battery the size that's less than a half a cc that lasts for 10 years to pace, right? The other one is procedure, right? Most medical devices require a procedure. They're equally important, right? Without the procedure correct, you can have the best stent in the world and if it's poorly deployed, you can kill a patient, right? So you need to have both procedure and that. And we have excellent procedure development capability. Those were unique in-house for us, right? When we started about it, you know, we basically were looking at how do we get the fixation, keep power down, because the power had to be down. We had a tiny little battery. We had to think about the electrode, the fixation mechanisms. We spent over a year and a half just doing computer models of fixation mechanisms, right? We ended up with nitinol tines that could actually each, there are four tines, and each of them hold about a pound newton force, but they can also be raked over the chordite tendineae or the structures in the heart, and they don't rip the tissue. It's very optimized or the way that it was done. It was also optimized so that with catheter delivery from the femoral access or through the leg up to the heart, when you put it up against the wall with the catheter, you actually pull back the catheter to engage the tissue because the nitinol tines reach out and grab the tissue and hold it. That was to not allow perforation. We didn't want perforation. We didn't want to push into the heart and actually create more damage. And so the procedure and that were related. In our first clinical trial that we did to get FDA approval, we had over 700 patients and not a single adverse event. And at least in the early follow-up period, not a single dislodgement, right? That was unheard of, right? I mean, our competitor, unfortunately, in their early clinical, they had two patient deaths with their clinical because they were perforating the ventricle, right? It was stopped. It took them some time to get caught up. And so putting that work up front, using your unique assets, again, battery technology to keep low power, capabilities and then our procedure development were critical for our success. We got FDA approval and we had market, um, um, we were only on the market, we were the only ones on the market for like two years, right? And so it was pretty incredible worldwide to have that capability. We now replaced with single chamber, I mean, we now replace probably about 20 to 40% of our pacing market with Leela's pacing. And that's gonna continue to grow. So you can have internal innovation and discovery as well, Again, focusing back on those key assets that we have that are unique to us. So amazing story. I'm going to ask you a question, it, and it doesn't necessarily have to do with internal innovation, right? I, I mean, what Medtronic did bringing micro to market was nothing short of amazing with the battery and, the, and just the, the entire story. My question is around the market being willing to embrace innovation and then kind of the adoption of that was because of how new that was, did did physicians have a hard time believing that it was possible? Was like, was there an adoption curve that was challenging? Like, you're bringing this to them, and they're like, "No way!" It's I, yeah, I, it's I don't question, believe. It. Question. Remember what I said though. You, you know, the better you solve the problem, the more value you create, right? In pacing, what is the biggest problem? People say, "Oh, pacing's easy, right? It, it's not a problem, right? Why are you even doing this?" Now we did get a lot of that, right? I mean, I'm not going to discount it, right? But remember. Even in the early days, not having a pocket in the chest, not having leads that go to the heart, right? The leads are the weak link, if you will, right? Those are the ones that have all the motion, that have fractures, that have problems with insulation, connection problems. The pocket up here, once you replace the battery, that's relatively easy, but that also puts patients more at risk of infection, right? We showed that with putting it in the ventricle, we didn't have infections. We had almost zero infections, right, with first implants. We also, I mean, it was a significant drop in complications with that. Also, no leads to replace, nothing else with the leads. So the patient had free access. You didn't have to worry about um, cable closure or restrictions or anything like that. So even though they may have been minor, people have known for 45, 50 years that these were complications that were caused because of the technologies we were using. And so that advancement where it was just like a procedure that you would go, like an acute procedure, it opened up the access as well to more users. Right? Remember, the early pacemakers were implanted by surgeons, then it went to electrophysiologists, and now it basically can be any interventional cardiologist. Right? So it opened up market access to other users to access pacing for patients as well. So it did several different things that it solved. So it actually created more value. Awesome. I, it, I mean, there were challenges, believe me. It yeah. didn't just happen by itself. That's for yeah, sure. I'm, I'm 
I'm sure there were, um, but it, I mean, again, it just goes to show you, you know, you said it, right? Like if, if you provide more value, that's, that's the game, right? That's, that's the world that we're, we're playing in. Um, yeah, another, mousetrap, another mousetrap wouldn't have gotten it, right? Just right. another pacing device wouldn't have gotten it. It had to create those other value opportunities. That's right. That's right. Tom, how about you? Yes. Yeah, so um, great example uh, that Michael gave. Um, I do want to go back to something Nancy said. She said, I don't know a day that we're not innovating. And that's the world of a startup, right? I mean, I, I think, you know, when it, when it comes to creativity, uh, it, it, you're not, if you're in a startup business, it, it's all about creativity. And yeah, the science will follow, but uh, in my mind, you know, and, and again, coming at this from a more of a business perspective, all of you folks on the technical side are, are technical artists, as I see it. Uh, you're, you're creating something that no one else thought of or could have come up with. And it's, it, it, it's absolutely, absolutely astounding to me. And yeah, the, the science is important. Uh, it's critical. At the end of the day, it won't work if the science isn't there. But the thought, the creativity, the artistry that that comes um, up with these ideas is is the stuff that amazes me. Um, and you know, to me, uh, and again, whether you're in a startup or you're in Medtronic coming up with some new and different technology, if if you don't have that muscle, eh, I don't think you're going to be very successful. So there's there's got to be a great balance between your technical knowledge and your creativity and uh, your artistic um, desire or will. So I could go on and on and on, but that's kind of my general summary. I have an example in Vail where we, you know, we ran into a technical issue uh, and, and it required some creative thinking to get around that. And I'll be darned if it didn't work. And, uh, you know, so we're we're going down the road. So I I, I applaud all those that that have that capability uh, and actually slightly envy it because it's uh, it's an amazing thing to watch. Yeah, yeah, it is. And and I think the beautiful thing too about the industry that we're in is what that innovation often results in. Right, is mm -hmm. the the direct impact on patients and their families and and their loved ones. And um, we're we're quite lucky and quite fortunate to be able to innovate in this space, right? Uh, it's it's really meaningful, meaningful work. Um, yeah, you know, so I just want to add on to Tom's thing because it made me think of a quote that John Sweeney, actually, one of the people there in Minneapolis with the Braveman Workshop, always says, you know, how do you become more comfortable being uncomfortable? And I find that innovators actually are very good at being uncomfortable, meaning they are comfortable not knowing all the inputs, what the answer is going to be. They're agile. They're they're observing so that they can get all the inputs that they can to actually go and fix the problem and move to the next step. And so I find that innovators are really good at observing and creating those choices that need to be got you know, for the next step. Uh, most people just walk right past them, and that's part of the problem, right? And so being more comfortable being uncomfortable, I think, is a very important aspect of how you have to be agile and always observing so that you can decide how to make the next move. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, I think that is a great way to wrap up our discussion. Um, I do want to leave just a couple minutes here uh, from the audience for Q&A. Ryan, it does look like we have a, a question from the audience. Uh, would you mind uh, reading that aloud to the panel? And uh, we can see if we can address that here. Yes, indeed. So we've got a question from an audience member uh, stating that, uh, is there any experience in raising money for a very small startup uh, pre-fundraising phase? Um, for phase one or two program, which was unsuccessful with a different company in the past for oncology, including a biomarker um, and a CDX and a discovery program, which was also unsuccessful with Big Pharma in the past. Um, how really do you get investors for these two programs? And then Ryan, I think there was a, the question afterward was a, was it a different question or was it building on the previous question? You know what? You're absolutely right. The second question from the same person's wondering, and really, I guess, to what extent 
uh, does a personal investor also look into the TA or indication experience of the company's team? Um, if there is no SME or medic with specific experience, for example, specific oncology, uh, nephrology, cardiology, um, as in the example above, is this already a no-go criteria before potentially successful funding, for example, um, with a non-binding term sheet, or what could happen? Okay. So if I were to summarize mm -hmm. that, um, and, and panel, feel free to, to, to jump into this. Um, and the individual who wrote this question, if, if I'm totally off base with this, please feel free to, to, to reiterate. Um, it, it sounds like a you know, small startup company, pre-fundraising phase, phase one or two program, uh, perhaps have, has been unsuccessful in the past and you're, you're also acknowledging the structure of the team uh, and potentially not having some, some level of subject matter expertise. Um, and so, you know, how do we get the, how do you get your company funded? What advice, um, you know, might the, the panelists have to, to help push, push that forward? It sounds like this is a companion diagnostic, so novel biomarker with therapeutic, which I have experience in. Um, that's a very challenging space. It's not a surprise that things have failed with a big company. Um, I would highly suggest uh, definitely bringing on the, the um, indication experience, the medical experience. Uh, that's extremely important. I would have the patients to go. So um, for novel biomarkers, and then you combine the novel biomarker as a companion, that, that's double risk. Um, definitely go for non-dilutive funding. You need to be patient for that. It does take a long time but it's going to be better than, because that's a long road. So you need the, the medical expertise. Um, the SBIR funding agencies will also look for that. Absolutely need a clinician um, that understands the indication. And I would highly recommend non-dilutive route for the early phase of funding. And there's a lot of non-dilutive funding for um, oncology especially and novel biomarkers. Uh, I, uh, oh, Michael, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, one of the other comments that I was going to make is, you know, I agree with everything Nancy said. Nancy has much more experience with that. I say just from a high level, um, you know, bringing on that SME expert or whatever is going to help you. How sure of you, if it hasn't worked in the past, do you understand why it didn't work in the past? And if it was because it didn't work, then did you come up with something, that, again, we talked about unique assets. Why do you think your solution is going to work? And do you feel pretty confident in that hypothesis that you're ready to go test it? Or was it just, I mean, so understanding, was it a financial reason? Was it a science reason? Was it a technology reason? Understanding the purpose of it not working in the past. And if you think you have a unique yes to fix that, then I think that that makes sense. But you need to make sure that you feel confident in that. Yeah, um, I certainly agree with all that. Um, you know, the, the, the second question, which, which is around um, personnel, uh, you know, my experience has been with investors that I've heard several investors say, I invest in the team first, in the technology second. Um, and so having the right team is critical. Um, so to that end, I, I would lean on what Nancy and Michael said. I think I think it sounds like you, you need that technical expertise there in house. I think that's important. Uh, and I also agree with Nancy. I think non-dilutive funding is going to be your your best bet. Uh, I you're going to have a I would say a difficult time getting investors to jump in on something that hasn't been proven out a little bit. And relative to your, Michael's discussion on the theory. You're going to have to prove out that theory, I think, before you're going to get uh, any outside capital come in, is my guess. Um, and the best way to get there is through non dilutive funding. All right. Well, thank you uh, to the audience member who asked the question. We really appreciate that. And we hope um, that was a valuable answer to you. If you have any follow ups with us, too. Um, we're going to share our, our contact information here in just a second, but uh, I did want to take a moment to say thank you. Uh, thank you to the attendees who took time out of their day today to uh, listen to this panel, uh, and a th major thank you to the panelists who uh, took time to prep for this and, and participate in the conversation, all of which 
uh, you guys have just such great experience and, and such depth of knowledge. So uh, we really appreciate the time. And uh, with that, I will hand it back over to Ryan. Well, thank you very much, all of you, for that wonderfully insightful discussion. But we have reached the end of our time here today. If we couldn't attend to your questions from the audience, the team at Veronex will follow up with you. Or if you have further questions, you can direct them to the email addresses that are up on your screen. I want to thank all of the audience for participating in today's webinar. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen as you exit, and your participation is appreciated as it helps us to improve our webinars. Now, I've also sent you a link in the chat box, and with this link, you'll be able to view the recording of this event on this page, and you can also share this link with your colleagues once they register for the recording here as well. So I encourage you to do that. Now, please join me in thanking all of our speakers for their wonderful time here today. We hope you found the webinar informative. Have a great day, everybody, and thank you for coming. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.